Well, it's great to see you all this morning. Um, You can open your copy of God's Word to John chapter 15 this morning, and in the Bibles around the room under chairs, that's on page 902. So, this is the second in our two-part series on church membership. So, a couple months ago, we shared that we developed a simple process for membership involving our Discover ZF course and meeting with an elder to share your story of coming to know Christ, and we're taking these two weeks to focus on a biblical vision of church membership. So, it's not comprehensive, but we're focusing on two key aspects of what it means to be the church and to be a member of the church. So, last week we focused on being members of Christ's body. This morning we're focusing on being united to Christ as friends. Now, before we get into this, I'll share what we're doing for our next sermon series. Um, I think it's accidental on my part, but good timing that we focused on church membership before I tell you about our next series, because if you're a member here, you're committed no matter what the next series is, right? Well, that's great because our next series is the book of Leviticus. So, hey, that's exciting. I'm glad you're excited. Um, I've actually been looking forward to this for a long time. Uh, This is probably the least appreciated book of the Bible. Studies will show that. It's where Bible reading plans go to die. Um, But my hope is to have a bit of a resurrection from those reading plans that are buried in what is thought of as the cemetery of the Old Testament. So, um, we're bored with Leviticus because we don't understand Leviticus. But when we see where this fits in the big story of the Bible and how this points to Jesus, and that it's really about God's heart to give us back what we lost in Eden, then this is relevant to every moment, and it's heart-thrilling by the Spirit. Um, So, I'm looking forward uh, to that with you all. But our focus this morning is on how the church is to cultivate a gospel culture of friendship. So, our culture is, if you're paying attention these past a uh, couple of years is clearly in a relational crisis, and it's not just because of the pandemic. You look at studies, relational connection, loneliness, uh, lack of friendship, all of this stuff was going on before the pandemic. In fact, one study shows that the decrease, the decline in friendship was more steep between 2014 and the pandemic than it was over the course of the pandemic. Um, so, this is nothing new. We're just starting to wake up to it. Um, And it's continued beyond that. So, the U.S. Surgeon General issued an advisory this year, a pretty lengthy report, and the report is titled, Our Epidemic of Loneliness and Isolation, the U.S. Surgeon General's Advisory on the Healing Effects of Social Connection and Community. Here's what he wrote in the introduction. In recent years, about one in two adults in America, so about half of the adults in America, reported experiencing loneliness, and that was before the COVID-19 pandemic cut off so many of us from friends, loved ones, and support systems, exacerbating loneliness and isolation. Loneliness is far more than just a bad feeling. It harms both individual and societal health. So, the report goes on to relate all the societal issues that are rooted in social isolation and loneliness, and then he writes, each of us can start now in our own lives by strengthening our connections and relationships. Our individual relationships are an untapped resource, a source of healing hiding in plain sight. Uh, It's actually a great report and study and just overview of what's going on, the the health effects of isolation and loneliness, uh, things that people can do in education and workplaces and individuals. Um, But we're living in what's probably the most connected, right, the social media uh, and phones, yet disconnected generation in human history. And this affects everyone, men and women, young and old. It's a global issue right now. Marriage rates are decreasing in our nation. More people are living alone. Participation in churches and other community organizations has drastically declined. And this decrease in connection is probably unsurprisingly corresponding with an increase in depression and anxiety and suicide rates, which are 
incredibly, uh, extremely growing and troubling, especially among men. And the church has, therefore, an incredible opportunity right now in this moment in history that God's placed us and in this society that He's placed us, an opportunity to show the way. So, loneliness and isolation are nothing new. Our tendency from the first day that sin entered the world is to pursue social isolation, to hide our true selves from one another, to long to be known yet not be honest enough to let our real self be known. And Jesus came to unite us in friendship with Himself, which sin broke, and as we're united to Jesus, we're united to one another as friends. So, Jesus came to create a community of love and connection in societies of sin and isolation. But here's the problem. Christians, Jesus' people, are often marked by the same loneliness and isolation and self-orientation in life as the rest of our culture. Church gatherings are often a collection of strangers sitting in lonely pews together and then going back to our lonely lives, consumed with other good things, maybe, work and family, and yet disconnected from real deep friendship and relationships with others. Jesus gives us a better vision here. He befriends us, and then He calls us to cultivate a gospel culture of friendship which is the local church. And that's what we can offer the world. So our text this morning is John 15, verses 12 to 17. So this is Jesus' final evening before He's crucified. He's preparing the disciples for their life after He leaves, and He defines their relationship with Him, and by implication, our relationship, if you're a Christian, with Him, in terms of friendship, and He calls us to a life of true friendship together. So this is John 15, 12 to 17. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I've heard from my Father I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank You for this Word spoken by the Lord Jesus and preserved by the Holy Spirit. And so we pray that You would help us to understand this wonderful reality of friendship and our role in enjoying it and cultivating it. We pray that we would sense this morning the friendship of Jesus and be eager to pursue by the Spirit's help friendship with one another all the more. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Jesus is here calling the church to cultivate a culture, a gospel culture of friendship. So, this shows four realities about friendship that we'll see here. The vision of friendship, the necessity, the experience, and the mission of friendship. So, first, the vision of friendship. His vision is for, I'd summarize it, for us to cultivate a gospel culture of friendship. Now, I'm calling it a gospel culture because this is about how our life together is to be shaped by the gospel. The gospel is this good news in this context of Jesus' befriending love towards sinners. And we are called to receive that love from Him and reflect that very love to one another as Christians in community. The heart of this is verses 12 to 13. So, look at it again with me. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I've loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. So, 
to summarize this, there's three essential parts to this vision that Jesus is giving here. He calls us to love one another as He loved us in terms of sacrificial friendship. So, first He calls us to love one another. That's the specific love of Christians for other Christians. That's what Jesus is focusing on here. This doesn't mean that we aren't to love other people. Of course, Jesus calls us to love all people, love your neighbor, love even your enemies. But there's a special love that we are to have for other Christians, just as Jesus has a special love for His people. And this is to be tangibly expressed in the local church. Second, He calls us to love one another as He loved us. You see that there? So, Jesus is the model and the standard when He says, love one another as I've loved you. His love is far deeper than our culture's view of love. He set His affection on His people from eternity past, and He will never lift that affection for eternity future. It will be with us forever. His love is so powerful that it creates love in us. He loves love into us. You know that? His people love in response to and empowered by the transforming effect of His love toward us. He loves love into us. So, the love of a local church that we experience, that we want to experience all the more, it comes from somewhere. And it doesn't just come originally from you and I getting really excited about loving people. It comes from us as we receive, individually and together, the befriending love of Father, Son, and Spirit, the love of God. And this this changes us. You start to have Christ's very affection for one another. We begin to treat each other how Jesus treats us. Now, the third part of the sentence, Jesus calls us to love one another as He loved us in terms of sacrificial friendship. Jesus defines this love in a way that's often missed among Christians. I don't know what it is about this text, but it does seem to be massively neglected by Christians, perhaps because many Christians love John 15, the first 11 verses about the vine and abiding. That's what we think of with this one. Or we're so interested, rightly so, in just this call to love one another and how it's to love as Jesus loves us. But we often miss the way that Jesus defines what this love is. And what it's supposed to look like. He's defining it for us in terms of friendship, sacrificial friendship. So, here's the flow of thought. In verse 12, Jesus calls us to love as He's loved us. And then in verse 13, He defines the nature of the love He's talking about. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Now, Jesus doesn't describe the greatest love how we might have expected. He doesn't say, greater love has no one than this, a mother's love for a child. He doesn't say, greater love has no one than this, the romance between a husband and a wife. When Jesus says what the greatest love is and that there's no love greater, it's the the love of friendship and in particular this act of giving one's life for a friend. Jesus is indirectly here speaking about the cross. He's going to be crucified in less than 24 hours. He's saying that at this to the disciples as he is being betrayed and as soldiers are about to come toward him soon enough. And he says that the greatest act of love in this context is when he says it is giving one's life for his friends. Then he says, you're my friends, right? He's speaking about what he's about to do for them indirectly. He wants them to know that the cross is about him laying his life down for friends, his friends. So, he's saying to them, look at me. Look at me when I'm dying for you tomorrow. I want to help you understand what's about to happen here. This is going to be the greatest expression of love in human history. The cross, as you see it and contemplate it, I want you to know that this is a cosmic act of friendship. That's what this is. This is a love that's to be embedded in the DNA of every local church. So he's speaking about the cross, but he's bringing it up in particular 
to help Christians see that's the kind of love that you're to love one another with. This kind of self-sacrificing love for friends that I'm going to do for you at the cross, Jesus says, that is supposed to be not just received, but also reflected together. This is the DNA of a local church. It's about laying lives down for one another. It's about the the love Christians are to have for each other. So this is Jesus' vision for the local church, for church membership, for his people. It's his vision for a gospel culture of friendship. He's saying, love one another as I have loved you in terms of sacrificial friendship. So every local church is to enjoy and intentionally cultivate a community and a culture that reflects this. That's the vision for church membership. So second, the necessity of friendship. Why does this matter? Well, it certainly matters because Jesus commanded it, right? So if you are a Christian and you hear this command, this is a non-negotiable. But notice he doesn't just call it a command. You see what he says? He says, this is my command. He's summing up everything he's commanded his people about how they're to treat one another, and everything boils down to this. Love for God is, of course, the priority. But as he's speaking about the horizontal relationships we have, he's saying flowing from God's love for us and our love for him is this love for one another. And this isn't the first time that he said this. He's actually picking up what he introduced in chapter 13. Look back at chapter 13 in verses 34 to 35. The text we're looking at is Jesus echoing, quoting again, and picking up what he started right here. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Right? That sounds very familiar, right? And then he adds this in the earlier text here, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So he calls it a new commandment here. And that's surprising because on the face of it, it doesn't seem too new, right? Old Testament, Jesus himself summarizes it. Love God, love your neighbor. So how is this new? Well, it's new because Jesus is intensifying it. He says, love one another just as I've loved you. So what is new is that our love for one another is to be a reflection of Jesus' love for us. And Jesus says, this is the mark of a Christian. Do you see that? There's an amazing little book on this text. I think it was just originally a talk by Francis Schaeffer called The Mark of a Christian. Here's what he said in it. Upon his authority, Jesus gives the world the right to judge whether you and I are born-again Christians on the basis of our observable love toward all Christians. He says there is a mark which If the world does not see it, allows them to conclude, this man's not a Christian. Now, of course, we may sometimes fail to love and still be a true, born-again, regenerate Christian. But the point is that Jesus is allowing the world to conclude that we aren't one if we don't have this love. So he's giving the mark of the Christian here. It's a love for other Christians that reflects the love of Jesus for Christians. We can get even more specific than this, though, because Jesus picks up this command again that he introduced in 13, 34 to 35. He picks it up again in our text this morning here, in chapter 15. And here, he defines more closely what this love is. And it's the love of sacrificial friendship. So it's this love the love of sacrificial friendship that is the mark of a Christian. The world can judge whether or not you are a Christian based upon whether you show real sacrificial friendship love toward other Christians. You see that's just bring these two texts together. This isn't that complicated. Just looking at what Jesus is saying. Love one another as I've loved you in terms of sacrificial friendship. That's how the world's going to know whether you're Christians or not. So that's what Jesus is saying. The mark of the Christian is the love of friendship. So here's what this means for us. Friendship is 
not optional for Christians. Friendship is not optional for churches. Pursuing true friendship with Christians is just as essential as the love command because it is the love command. You see this? The same thing. This is how Jesus defines his love command. So there there can be no diminishing of the central importance of friendship. It's the mark that Jesus says the world can use to conclude whether or not we're real Christians or not. So Christian friendship, not the superficial, chummy vision of friendship that's common in our culture, but the kind of deep sacrificial love that Jesus displayed at the cross. This is just as deep as the meaning of the cross here. That's the love that the community of faith is to live out. So the mark of the Christian is love, and so the mark of the Christian is friendship. Those are not two different statements. They're the same reality. So that's why friendship matters. So third, experiencing friendship or the experience of friendship. This is now verses 14 and 15. This shows us that friendship is here for us to receive and reflect. This is such good news. I mean, when, when we read in the Bible that John says in a later letter um, that his commands aren't burdensome, this is a wonderful command. This is a life-giving command. We're often terrible at it because of our sin, but like what a, what a gift that this is what he commands us to do, to, to live the life that our culture knows we all should, should want um, right now. So friendship's here to receive and reflect. We receive it from Jesus. We reflect it to one another. So let's look at verses 14 and 15. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant doesn't know what his master's doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I've heard from my father I've made known to you. So first we receive Jesus' friendship, then we reflect it. So we receive it first. In verse 13, he drew attention to love as laying down one's life for his friends. And then in verse 14, he says, you are my friends. So he gave the command to love one another as friends. And then now he focuses on his love for his people as friends. So what's he doing? Well, he's showing that the source of our friendships with one another is his friendship with us. The way to live out this friendship love is by being befriended by Jesus. So he says, you love one another as friends, and you're my friends. And let me tell you about that. I've made you my friends. So Jesus is saying here that he's, he's actually changing the way that he identifies in relation to his people. His disciples, he says, are no longer called his servants by him but friends. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that disciples are no longer servants, and being a servant is an incredible privilege. It's no small thing. But apparently for Jesus, it's not high enough of an honor. He's not content for you to be honored with the title of servant, though that'd be a privilege. He says, I'm not going to call you servants anymore. I'm calling you friends. Some of us hear this and maybe recoil a bit. You're used to thinking about Jesus as Savior uh, or King, and that's good and true, but some of you maybe are so used to exclusively relating to Jesus in terms of a King who commands and a servant or in a Savior who saves that you miss this. You don't have a category for the Lord Jesus to call you his friend and mean it. Your relationship with Jesus is distant because of this. And it's distant in a way that Jesus does not intend for it to be, doesn't want it to be. Jesus is our king, but he's also our truest friend and calls us friends. Others of you may misunderstand this as kind of a light, frothy, superficial thing, and there's no lack of evidence that some people have taken it this way. To say Jesus' is friend can sound cheesy, but I think that's just because we are immersed in a culture that has too low of a view of friendship. If you hear Jesus say, you're my friends, and you think, what is that? That says more about you than it does about Jesus, right? It's your view of friendship that's so small and so low and so thin 
that you would hear Jesus call you a friend and think, yeah, that's not for me. That's for maybe some other people. Um, I take Jesus seriously. Yeah. Jesus wants us to take him seriously as a friend. And so, Jesus is talking about the greatest love, the deepest love, the most sacrificial love. That's the love of friendship he talks about here. And notice how Jesus describes what this friendship's marked by. It's marked by transparency. That's the point in verse 15. The difference between a servant and a friend, why Jesus is switching the title, is self-disclosure. It's revealing of deep personal knowledge. That's what he's doing for the disciples on the final night. He's saying, I've, I've let you know everything my Father revealed to me. He's opening his mind and heart to them. He's, he does this continually now still through the Scripture. He sent the Spirit, even in this conversation, um, a little before this and after, he says, I'm sending the Spirit to you so he can remind you of all these things. And we're so thankful he did because he wrote them down. Chapters 13 to 17 is Jesus' self-disclosure that he gave the disciples to say, look, I'm your friend. And now he preserved it for us. And as you as a Christian read God's Word with the Spirit illuminating you, it, it should be and can be an act of friendship of Jesus' self-disclosure to you here. So he's revealing himself. Transparency, that's the mark of friendship. You know what real friendship is? It's being completely known and at the same time completely loved. That's what friendship is. It's being known to your depths and then being loved to the end. It's the love of Christ. So I just want to pause and ask, have you received this friendship of the risen Jesus? If you're not a Christian, I wonder if you have heard before this aspect of what it means to be a Christian and who Jesus is. Christianity is not mainly about rules. It's about being known and loved by God. And the rules he gives us are the pathway to experience and express this love toward him. It's about receiving forgiveness and friendship from the God who made us. And the cross is how he provides this friendship for us. It's an act of friendship because he's taking the punishment our sin deserves upon himself so that we aren't separated from him forever. But we can be in God's presence forever, completely forgiven and righteous in his sight. And so he invites you, if you've never come to Jesus as a friend, he invites you to come to him, receive his forgiveness, receive his friendship. And if you're a Christian, do you realize, maybe not just right now, but functionally throughout a week, do you realize this is part of his disposition toward you? He views you as a friend? He's not just your savior and your king. He's also your truest friend. He died for you to befriend you. So do you relate to him on terms of friendship? So we experience this friendship by receiving it from Jesus. And second, by reflecting it to others. That's the heart of the text. We love others how he loved us or as he's loved us in terms of friendship. So this is one of the central ways that we actually obey Jesus. Do you realize that? His central command is to love one another as friends. And so pursuing this kind of friendship love together is how we obey Jesus. It's how we express our obedience to him. This really is the point of verse 14 as well. That may have sounded confusing at first. He said, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Now, first of all, that if is not a condition in the sense of you'll become my friends after you get your act together and start obeying me. No, this probably has a sense of you show yourself to be my friends when you do what I command. And this reminds us, of course, that Jesus is not just our friend. He is also our king. He doesn't stop being our king as he introduces himself as our friend. He's both at the same time. And I think the best illustration of this is with David and Jonathan in the Old Testament. David was the anointed king. Jonathan was his closest friend. And so for Jonathan, David is both his king and his friend. And that's how we relate to Jesus. And there's this moment when David and Jonathan are talking, and Jonathan says to David, whatever you say, I'll do for you. 
that expresses it. Jonathan was able to relate to David as the king and the friend. We don't get David saying to Jonathan, whatever you, do, I'll, whatever you say I'll do for you, I'll obey you. No, we, we obey Jesus, but that doesn't mean he's not our friend. We've just got to hold them both together at the same time. But also think about this. What is the command that we're to obey to prove our friendship? When he says, you're my friends if you do what I command you. Well, it's the command to love one another as friends. When he says, you are my friends if you do what I command you, we think, well, what has he commanded us? He just told us, this is my command. Love each other in terms of friendship. He's saying, you are my friends if you love one another in terms of friendship. It's our sincere friendship love with other Christians that proves we're friends to Jesus. Really not so much different than what he said in chapter 13, that love is the mark of a Christian and it proves you're my disciples. It also proves that you're his friend. So this is how we experience friendship. But at this point, it could seem a bit inward focused. If we're a church filled with friendship, what about our mission to our neighbors and the nations? This actually does relate directly to mission. It's how our lives can draw people to Jesus. In the previous series, this kind of outward-oriented series we had, People for the World, we noted how in Deuteronomy 4, God's people were to have a public witness to God through their lives of love together. He gives the law, summarized as love, to attract the nations to God so that they say, my goodness, never seen commands like that, never seen a God so near as that. That's, that's what Jesus is getting at here as well. As Christians in the New Testament, we don't have only a come and see orientation, but a go and tell, but the come and see never stops. We go and tell, but not just as individuals, we go and tell people to come and see the difference Jesus makes. And so, the fourth thing we see here is the mission of friendship, and this is verse 16. Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you or set you apart that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide or remain. So he's speaking to the 11 apostles here, but his words apply to all disciples as they do throughout this text. He chose us to be his friends. He set us apart for a purpose. And that purpose, he says, is to go and bear fruit. And the fruit he has in view here is probably the fruit that comes from mission. Jesus says, go and bear fruit. It's seeing people come to know Jesus as their truest friend. So this is our mission in the world. We are befriended by Jesus to enjoy friendship with one another and invite other people into this community of friendship with Jesus at the center. And so we see how this love of friendship and mission work together in Jesus' prayer in John 17. So just flip ahead to John 17, verse 21. Here's Jesus' prayer later that evening. He's in many ways summarizing the heart of what he's been saying to his disciples and turning this into a prayer. And he prays this in verse 21, that they, referring to his people, may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So this language of oneness here, picking up on this theme of loving one another in our text. And then he prays that we be unified in this gospel culture of friendship love. And what's the purpose of this? When Jesus is now asking the Father to do this by the power of the Holy Spirit, make this happen. Help them be a gospel culture of unity and love and friendship. What's the purpose? That the world would know that you sent me, right? That the world would know that the gospel that these Christians are talking about is true. So that means that our, our culture of friendship that we create here needs to be an observable reality to people that aren't Christians so that they conclude not just, okay, those are Jesus' disciples, I see the mark, but they conclude, oh, and the Jesus they're talking about is real. He really did come because the kind of stuff that the Surgeon General is saying we need to cultivate is actually happening in these local churches. And it's supernatural and it's unexplainable. It, they're reflecting the friendship of our Maker who came in the flesh to befriend us. And they're just so filled up with the love of Christ, moment by moment, that the Lord Jesus has loved love into them. It's gotta be true. 
So Francis Schaeffer calls this Christian love in John 17, 21, the final apologetic of the gospel. Apologetics involves answering people's questions about Christianity. We need intellectual apologetics. We'll focus at least in part on that in our men's retreat coming up in November. But even if we answer all of their questions, are they going to listen to us and take us seriously if we don't have love and it makes no observable difference in our life? Here's how Schaefer put it. Without true Christians loving one another, Christ says the world cannot be expected to listen even when we give proper answers. Let us be careful indeed to spend a lifetime studying to give honest answers. For years, the Orthodox Evangelical Church has done very poorly. So it is well to spend time learning to answer the questions of people who are around us. But after we've done our best to communicate to a lost world, still we must never forget that the final apologetic which Jesus gives is the observable love of true Christians for true Christians. In light of what we're seeing in John 15, if we bring this to bear, as we should, we can add this. It is true sacrificial friendship that is the final apologetic for the gospel. That's the love and unity that Jesus is talking about here. So the final apologetic is friendship. We have an incredible opportunity in our culture right now. People are lonely and isolated and long for friendship. Most of the most popular shows that people have watched had friendship as a, a central, or central or one of the central themes, right? Friends, The Office, House, so many movies. People are searching and finding some form of friendship in communities, often online communities that are gathered around one very isolated aspect of life. These friendships are often thinly based on ideological or political alignment on a few issues, but it's not the deep love and friendship that Jesus is talking about here and that he offers. Jesus is calling us then to do a couple things here. Don't disconnect mission from friendship. And don't disconnect friendship from mission. They belong together. Jesus is sending his church out to be communities of light and love and friendship to show the world that he's real and he's the friend of sinners. So let's wrap up with just a few strategies for cultivating this gospel culture of friendship. I'll just note seven of them here. Um, but this, this affects all of life um, and really does require it, a radical reorientation in life, perhaps for some of us. Others of you are doing an incredible job at this. So just hear this for where you are and what you need to hear to take another step. And we can all take another step. Number one, build this into your life. God made us for friendship. It's why we long for it. It's why the Surgeon General would issue an advisory in a culture that lacks it. And our longing then is not the result of evolution. It's not just strategic for survival. It's in our design. So don't just value family and school and work. Our culture does a great job elevating those and taking all of our time around those. And then we don't have any time for anything left. Or if we do, binge watch Netflix or whatever it is, right? Alone. So don't just value those things. Jesus said, my command is that you love one another. So if you're going to be a Christian who obeys Jesus, you've got to take this seriously. And once again, it's both like a command we've got to obey, this is serious, and like this is the path of life and joy. Like this is awesome. This is what Jesus says to go enjoy. You get to have this kind of life. And the God who made you says, well done. So build it in your life. Second, cultivate this on Sundays. There's this is the reason behind why we often say come early and linger longer. It's for the sake of cultivating a gospel culture of friendship. Jesus says that the world is to see the love of Christian friendship. But so many Sunday gatherings are designed without time for this. So that's why we encourage you, come early. That's part of what we're doing on Sunday morning. 
Um, and, and look for people who are lonely and look for people to engage with and go deeper than superficial and stick around. It's an essential part of what we're doing here on Sundays. And third, cultivate friendship in your small group. So small groups are not just a, for a meeting, but for the context of creating relationships and encouraging relationships. Now, I don't think everyone in your small group needs to be your closest friend, but wouldn't it be weird if none of them became your friends? We should have friends both inside and outside of small groups. And so as part of a small group, be transparent. State the honest state of your soul together. Pour out your hearts in prayer when you pray together. Get food going at your meetings if you don't have it. God gave it for friendship. And create contexts like barbecues for inviting people who don't know Christ to experience the relational love that you have together. Invite them into those friendships. It's an apologetic for the gospel. Fourth, open your home for hospitality. Hospitality, um, not entertaining, right? Entertaining is getting everything perfect to make a show and make yourself look good. Um, Slightly overstated. Hospitality is simply opening your heart and home to outsiders. Invite another Christian and someone who doesn't know Jesus together at the same time. Love them well. Help that person who's not a Christian experience a friendship between Christians to observe what Jesus said the world needs to be able to see. Show people the nature of true friendship. Fifth, don't make yourself an exception. Sometimes we can hear a message like this and think, I agree, that's great, no issue in general. My situation, though, is a bit different. Don't do that. You may be thinking, well, I'm in midlife. My family life's full. My workload's full. I've got this stretch that I've got to give to. I've kind of lost touch with my friends. I'll pick it back someday. Or maybe I'm in my last stretch of life. I know some of you, this is really hard because your closest friends may have passed away. And you're grieving that. But the Lord still has for you more friendships. Or you may be thinking, I've tried and I have tried to make friends and it doesn't work. I give up. I'm fine. But to everybody, Jesus says, this is my command, that you love one another as I've loved you as friends. Sixth, become like the great friend. Christian growth, discipleship, is learning from Jesus to become like Jesus. That's what discipleship is. And here we see that Jesus is the greatest friend. He's the model of true friendship and love. And so, as you become like the greatest friend, you will become a better friend. And that should be the goal anyways, not just to find good friends, but to be one. And then finally, enjoy this friendship with the great friend. He is the source of all of this. Remember, he loves love into us. So, the U.S. Surgeon General's advisory report is actually really good. It holds, there's a few paragraphs in there that hold out a beautiful picture of real community, of love and mutual concern and support and rejoicing and celebrating with each other in good times and weeping with those who weep kind of language. But our nation doesn't just need a reminder. Like an advisory is not going to wake everyone up and all of a sudden we'll have this thing. It's not like we all like, oh, that's what we forgot. We we forgot that we're supposed to actually love people. Like it can do, it can do good. So I'm not dismissing. I'm really grateful for it and really grateful for the, the wisdom of it. But What's going to change our hearts is by being befriended by Jesus, the God who made us, who created this vision in the first place, who created the longing, to whom it's no surprise that life unravels when we do a terrible job like this in a society. This God has come to befriend us. And so let's enjoy friendship with Jesus together. He knows us all the way down, and He loves us to the very end. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that this is reality, that this is your command through Jesus, that this is who you are, this is who you invite us to become and empower us to become. This is our eternal future before us laid out in the new creation. It's realities like this that convince us this is is too good for us to make up. And so we thank you that we get to receive this. So thank you for the gospel culture of friendship that you have been cultivating in our church over the years. We pray that you would surge it forward and let us be a witness in our community and a place where people find the friend of sinners. Amen.